In a dimly lit, hushed room swirling with cigar smoke, J.P. Morgan sat like a king on his throne, emanating an aura of unassailable power. Across from him, political candidate William McKinley's face was etched with lines of worry and exhaustion, visibly burdened by the sinking reality that his presidential dreams could soon disintegrate into dust. The year was 1896, and America stood at a political precipice. You see, McKinley's campaign was gasping for financial life, teetering on the edge of insolvency. Sensing the moment's gravity, Morgan unceremoniously produced a staggering check, instantly lifting the weight from McKinley's shoulders and infusing newfound hope into his weary eyes. With that monumental financial lifeline, Morgan didn't just rescue McKinley's campaign, he essentially bought himself a president. Indeed, the sheer audacity of the act is mind-boggling. Imagine a single private citizen with the clout and resources to effectively install a US president, forever cementing his influence into the core of the American establishment. However, in some ways, Morgan wasn't an anomaly, but rather the crowning jewel in a lineage whose name has become an awe-inspiring symbol of American affluence and dominion. For over two centuries, the Morgans have stood as larger-than-life figures, their reach extending from early merchant endeavors to contemporary financial juggernauts like J.P. Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley, and Morgan Grenfell. Without a doubt, this old money family hasn't just participated in the creation of modern America, they are some of its primary architects and patrons. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, join us as we retell the entire family saga from their maritime merchant ancestors through J.P. Morgan, the man who essentially invented American finance as we know it, all the way to recent members you can find on social media with parents on reality television. It's quite the story, we'll tell you. With that said, let us begin. From their initial voyage across the storm-tossed Atlantic in 1636, the Morgan family have established themselves as integral elements in the American narrative from the very beginning. Departing the 17th century Welsh countryside, they sought the verdant possibilities of the then Massachusetts Bay Colony, guided by an intoxicating blend of zeal and the quest for an unblemished life. Their ancestor, Miles Morgan, initially settled in Roxbury, Massachusetts, before recognizing the greater opportunities that Springfield presented. At the time, he took on various roles, warrior, farmer, and revered community figure, and attempt to provide pivotal contributions to a colonial society in its infancy. Given such a backdrop as having ancestors here longer than the country has been in existence, sometimes called having American founding stock lineage, it is likely that the Morgans do not see themselves as mere citizens, but as a seminal part of the American founding pedigree. Over decades, this self-perception probably kindles both an exalted pride and a ceaseless ambition, with each successive generation perceiving itself as the custodian of an ancestry that had its roots in the earliest colonial vessels. This sense of duty has thus served as an impassioned catalyst for their various exploits, be it military service, commercial ventures, or their conspicuous role in the social strata. Therefore, as history's pages continued to unfurl, the Morgans continued to evolve from local merchants to dynamic participants in America's fight for independence and economic self-sufficiency. A quintessential portrait of this evolution is Joseph Morgan, Jr., the illustrious great-grandson of Miles Morgan. Holding the rank of captain in the Massachusetts militia, Joseph was therefore an active participant in the drama of the American Revolutionary War, not merely an observer. Post-war, Joseph ventured into the bustling commercial sphere of Connecticut. There, he operated a diverse array of enterprises, a tavern, coffeehouse, and stagecoach line, before co-founding the Etna Fire Insurance Company in 1819. Indeed, this endeavor has a legacy that reverberates even today. Etna has evolved into a colossal entity, its roots deeply embedded in the soil of American business history. In 1835, Etna, under Joseph's direction, experienced a windfall, covering the damages sustained by Wall Street firms during the Great Fire of New York. The decisive moment arrived when Joseph purchased the stakes of hesitant Aetna investors, promptly dispersing insurance payouts to the beleaguered banks. This swift action cemented Aetna's reputation on Wall Street and catapulted its premiums in subsequent years. Therefore, Joseph's commercial triumphs represent a pivotal moment in Morgan history. He was the first family member to be intricately involved 
with a corporate titan that continues to exert considerable influence today. To put this into a bird's eye view perspective, the Morgans have thus been business pioneers longer than the United States has even been a country. Now, paving the way for future generations, Joseph would sire a son, Junius Spencer Morgan, destined to become another influential family figure on the global financial stage. Born in Holyoke, Massachusetts in 1813 to Joseph and Sarah Morgan, as was common for entrepreneurial young men of the time, Junior skipped the hallowed halls of university. Instead, at the age of 16, he apprenticed himself to Alfred Wells, a Boston merchant banker. For the next five years, Junius gained invaluable experience in the mercantile and banking spheres, absorbing the intricacies of the financial sector in both Boston and New York. You see, Junius was initially drawn to the sphere of business out of a keen sense for opportunity and an innate knack for numbers, more than a little influenced by the American ethos that equated financial success with virtue. Yet for all his prowess, Junius faced numerous challenges. His ventures, notably in the formation of J.S. Morgan and company, were examined through the lens of ethical inquiry. Critiques often emerged about the firm's investments in enterprises of a morally ambiguous nature, industries built on the backs of underpaid labor, and deals that perpetuated social inequality. Though Junius's financial mastery was beyond reproach, it existed in a delicate interplay with ethical questions that resisted facile resolutions. In 1854, he subsequently embarked on a transformative chapter, uprooting himself to London, a calculated move underpinned by a melange of ambition and practicality. At that time, London was the pulsating heart of global finance and trade, providing Junius a grander stage to magnify his undertakings. In this teeming metropolis, he confronted an intricate tapestry of challenges. For example, America's burgeoning economic protectionism at the time often clashed with Britain's entrenched advocacy for free trade. On the flip side, Britain kept a vigilant eye on the fledgling United States, concerned that its global supremacy could be threatened by American ascendancy. Junius became the dynamic head of the firm in 1859, while Peabody remained the symbolic senior partner. He then inserted himself into London's high society, hosting opulent gatherings at his residences near Hyde Park and in Roehampton. And although Junius's Peabody and company had considerable involvement in the transatlantic cotton trade, their core business lay in relationships with eastern US banks and railroad companies. This strategic alignment allowed them to remain somewhat insulated from the direct implications of American slavery, a contentious issue that gripped many London-based banks at the time. Therefore, during the tumultuous years of the American Civil War, Junius aligned his interests with the Union. The firm capitalized on this allegiance, trading Union war bonds to astonishing profits. Thus, nestled amidst these geopolitical tectonics and economic dissonances, Junius evolved into an invaluable liaison between American magnates and their European counterparts. He found himself enmeshed in the complex interplay of British-American trade negotiations and international diplomacy. But as Junius and his associates deftly navigated the intricacies of international finance through J.S. Morgan and company, they could scarcely have foreseen that the legacy they were building would not merely endure, but would be monumentally amplified by the next generation through his son. Born in 1837, John Pierpont Morgan's path to financial eminence appeared practically preordained. Under the rigorous guidance of his aforementioned father, Junius Spencer Morgan, his upbringing was a fusion of privilege, deliberate strategizing, and a unique set of hardships. You see, Junius was unrelenting in his expectations, pushing his son to excel in every aspect of life. This demanding upbringing had its own difficulties, as John Pierpont was burdened not only by his father's monumental pressures to succeed, but also by a recurrent skin ailment, rosacea, which would accompany J.P. Morgan throughout his life. Furthermore, this facial condition not only scarred him physically, but also influenced how he presented himself to the world. Because of his skin issues, Morgan was selective about how he was photographed, often favoring profiles that lessened the visual impact of his facial challenges. Yet what many perceived as a facial anomaly became, in some ways, an asset in a ruthless business world. His imposing countenance, partly a result of his skin condition, became legendary for intimidating competitors and associates alike. It was as if his visage mirrored the formidable, unyielding nature of his character. Now, to mold his son into a refined, cosmopolitan individual, 
Junius sent young Morgan to a medley of educational institutions. From the Episcopal Academy in Connecticut to the University of Göttingen in Germany, Morgan's educational journey was as broad as it was elite. This eclectic upbringing served as the cornerstone for a life destined to leave an unforgettable mark on the American business landscape, framing not only his capabilities in finance, but also his nuanced understanding of art, languages, and the complexities of human life. However, J.P. Morgan's early career wasn't without controversy, particularly during the Civil War years. Viewing the war itself not as a calamity, but as a lucrative venture, Morgan dabbled in the morally murky waters of war profiteering. One episode that particularly stands out as emblematic of Morgan's contentious actions is the infamous Hall Carbine Affair. In this venture, Morgan financed the acquisition of 5,000 surplus rifles, each costing a mere $3.50. These firearms were subsequently sold to Union forces at a hefty profit, illustrating his willingness to capitalize on the nation's fractured state. Such maneuvers would cast a long shadow over his illustrious career, sculpting the narrative that painted him as a cold-hearted capitalist ready to profit from a nation torn asunder. Additionally, another noteworthy episode during the war occurred when J.P. Morgan's father received the crucial news of the fall of Vicksburg, before it was common knowledge in London's financial circles. Utilizing telegraph communications with his son John Pierpont in New York, Junius Spencer was alerted to this pivotal event in the American Civil War ahead of his competitors. Armed with this advance intelligence, the Morgans astutely seized the opportunity to buy up Union war bonds before their prices soared with the newfound optimism for the Union cause. This prescient move not only swelled their coffers, but also showcased the Morgan family's uncanny knack for exploiting real-time information, further consolidating their commanding presence in the intricate theatre of finance. Such episodes, marred by ethical dilemmas yet undeniably shaping his path, contributed to the complex legacy that the early Morgans would leave behind. They reveal a group not just of immense influence and financial acumen, but also ones who tread the blurry line between opportunism and the darker facets of capitalism. Now, in 1871, J.P. Morgan's career took a monumental turn with the formation of Drexel, Morgan & Company, a venture with Philadelphia financier Anthony Joseph Drexel. Operating as an agent for European investments in the United States, the company played a pivotal role in reshaping the American economy, which until then had a robust market mainly for railroads and canals. To be clear, Drexel Morgan & Company wasn't just successful, it was transformative, and it revitalized the American securities market and expanded the national capital market. But the company faced its fair share of controversies, often labeled as a symbol of greed and unchecked corporate power. However, at the dawn of the 20th century, John Pierpont Morgan found himself on the cusp of orchestrating what would become his financial masterstroke. Driven by an unquenchable thirst for consolidation and a vision of a streamlined, globally competitive American steel industry, Morgan aimed to achieve what no one before him had dared, the formation of the world's first billion-dollar corporation. The audacious venture took form as U.S. Steel, a behemoth birthed from the amalgamation of Federal Steel Company and Andrew Carnegie's Steel Leviathan. Morgan's strategic calculations were astute. By creating U.S. Steel, he sought to capture untapped economies of scale, thereby bolstering the competitiveness of American steel on the global stage. Indeed, the maneuvers he employed to pull this off were as complex as they were daring. Through skillful negotiations, a knack for understanding corporate value, and an unparalleled network of contacts, Morgan managed to convince key stakeholders that consolidation was the path to future profit and national prominence. Yet this monumental accomplishment did not escape scrutiny. Critics were quick to denounce U.S. Steel as a monopoly, a dominating force that not only sought to control steel production, but also aspired to wield undue influence over affiliated industries. Such aggressive labor policies and a voracious appetite for control fanned the flames of public debate. The controversy that enveloped U.S. Steel would echo in the chambers of policymakers, playing a significant role in shaping antitrust laws and labor rights for years to follow. Indeed, even as his titanic achievement with U.S. Steel stirred turbulent waters of public discourse and legislative apprehension, J.P. Morgan managed to sail relatively unscathed. 
His cultivated social prominence and intricate web of influential connections, interwoven with a nuanced understanding of legal boundaries, afforded him a buffer from the severest of societal and legal reprisals. However, after the monumental creation of U.S. Steel, Morgan would not rest on his laurels. He subsequently continued to be a dominant force in American finance, playing critical roles in stabilizing the U.S. economy during periods of financial panic. Notably, his intervention in the Panic of 1907 showcased his immense influence, as he personally orchestrated a bailout of sorts, convening with other titans of industry to prevent a broader economic collapse. Additionally, as a patron of the arts, he amassed an extensive collection, including rare books and manuscripts, further etching his influence on American culture. But as time wore on, Morgan began to prepare for the inevitable passing of the torch. Though he would never completely step away from the empire he had built, he started laying the groundwork for the next generation. His son, J.P. Morgan Jr., would therefore inherit not just a business but an entire ethos, a philosophy of financial influence, social prominence, and yes, the intricate dance with public scrutiny and legislative oversight. Now, each successive generation of Morgans made its own unique contributions to the family legacy. Born as the heir apparent, the aforementioned John Pierpont Morgan Jr., commonly known as Jack, attended prestigious institutions like St. Paul's School and Harvard College before following in his father's footsteps in both finance and philanthropy. Later, Jack's high-stakes involvement in World War I would display an uncanny resemblance to his father's actions during the American Civil War. As his firm became the sole supplier of munitions for the Allies, he facilitated massive loans and supply agreements with the British and French governments, earning a staggering 1% commission on $3 billion. While these transactions significantly funded the war effort and brought him enormous prestige, they also attracted criticism. He was accused of influencing American foreign policy for personal gain, specifically. Allegations suggested he pushed the US closer to joining the war to safeguard his extensive investments. Therefore, this duality of financial success, marred by ethical questioning, echoed his father's controversial business choices during the Civil War. Both men leveraged national conflict as a springboard for immense profit, and both faced public scrutiny for their willingness to capitalize on such grim circumstances. Furthermore, the Morgans were seminal in the founding of America's central bank, the Federal Reserve System, in 1913. After the aforementioned Panic of 1907 revealed the fragility of the US financial system, J.P. Morgan Sr. played a key role in conceptualizing a centralized banking structure. The family's influence therefore pervaded the Federal Reserve's architecture, triggering debate over the extent to which private banking interests had molded public policy. Soon thereafter, the Great Depression wreaked havoc on John Pierpont Morgan Jr.'s financial empire, causing his assets to sharply decline from a staggering $704 million to a lesser $425 million. Adding fuel to the fire was the Senate's Pecora hearings in 1932, which served as a catalyst for public animosity against Wall Street titans, with Morgan Jr. becoming a symbol of a flawed and failing financial system. These hearings thereby crystallized the public's image of Morgan Jr. as someone who opportunistically profited during periods of economic hardship, further intensifying the scrutiny his family had long been under. Additionally, amidst this turbulent backdrop, Morgan Stanley was founded in 1935, conceived as a direct response to the Glass-Steagall Act, which mandated the separation of commercial and investment banking activities. The company was meant to carry on the Morgan family's investment banking operations. Specifically, Henry Sturgis Morgan, a grandson of J.P. Morgan, was among its co-founders. The inception of Morgan Stanley thus served a dual purpose. It not only complied with new federal regulations, but also provided a pathway for the Morgan legacy to adapt and persist in a drastically altered financial landscape. Therefore, the Morgan legacy wouldn't end with Junior, it would continue with his grandchildren, J.P. Morgan III and Henry Sturgis Morgan. United in their business acumen, they additionally fused two banking powerhouses, Morgan Guarantee Trust Company of New York and J.P. Morgan & Company to birth Morgan Guarantee Trust which swiftly ascended the ranks to become a dominant global financial institution. This institution found itself in a complex geopolitical web during the Cold War era. As Morgan Guarantee Trust was intricately tied to significant corporations, both within the United States and globally, it couldn't escape scrutiny. 
Questions over the bank's vast influence and the ethical considerations surrounding its global footprint became subjects of intense discussion. Rolling into the 1980s, the Morgan lineage widened its financial focus by venturing into diverse investment channels. Alongside, they amplified their charitable work through ventures like the Morgan Family Fund and the Morgan Library and Museum. These altruistic efforts could not fully silence lingering questions about the source of their colossal wealth, a scrutiny intensified by the family's by then 100-year involvement in wartime profiteering and strategic corporate maneuvering. Now, the turn of the millennium saw another milestone when J.P. Morgan and company united with Chase Manhattan Corporation. This merger created a financial juggernaut, raising eyebrows around antitrust issues. Nevertheless, such concerns were eventually sidelined, allowing this new entity to consolidate its formidable status in global banking. As of the last few years, the Morgan family remains firmly rooted in the echelons of old money, albeit in a somewhat unexpected manner, and not always in a quiet wealth kind of fashion. One example includes John Adams Morgan, who tied the knot with fashion designer and reality TV star Sonia Morgan in 1998. They have a daughter, Quincy Adams Morgan, who has mostly been kept away from the public eye. However, pictures of her are easily found on social media. Quincy recently graduated summa cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania in 2023, before moving to Los Angeles to ostensibly find a new path. Simultaneously, keeping to the old money principle of intermarriage between noble families, there is actually an entire segment of the Morgan dynasty who are members of the British aristocracy. You see, Mary Lyman Morgan Burns, a sister of J.P. Morgan, had a daughter, Mary Ethel, who married into the illustrious Harcourt family by becoming Viscountess Harcourt in 1899. Indeed, the name Harcourt has been a fixture in British history, going as far back as the 1100s. Over the centuries, the Harcourt family has amassed considerable influence in various sectors, most notably in politics and diplomacy. Further cementing the Morgans' foray into British aristocracy, Cynthia Mary Burns, related to the family through Walter Spencer Morgan Burns, married Sir John Gorn Carew Pole, 12th Baronet, in 1928. The Pole Baronetcy is additionally one of the oldest in England, with a lineage dating back to the early 1600s, with roots in both politics and military service. Therefore, the story of the Morgans is a fascinating odyssey, from humble maritime merchants to powerful financiers who shaped epochs, with tentacles reaching into the creation of America's financial infrastructure, intricate engagements in global conflicts, and connections to British aristocracy. Their influence is as complex as it is vast. And, as if to put a cherry on top, They've also become household names in the nation's most essential financial institutions. Thus, in many ways, the Morgans encapsulate the multifaceted dimensions of American financial and political history, embodying both the benefits and complications that come with immense power and wealth. And now, we'd like to see you in the comments. Do you find the Morgan family story to be an inspiring tale of acute financial skill or a frustrating example of greed and ethical ambiguity? We're sure there will be a lively contrasting of opinions on this one. We appreciate your time watching this longer episode. And as always, thanks again for joining us for another edition of Old Money Luxury. Cheers until next time.